All right, well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to talk with you guys about uh, Sea of Shadows. Incredible film, a really unusual one when it comes to environmental issues. It's the rare biodiversity film that also involves uh, boat chases, shootouts, <laughs> a couple other things that I might be missing here. Um, but uh, really remarkable, remarkable film. And I'd love to start um, by asking you both about the genesis of this film. Um, again, as I said, it's, it's very complicated. Um, it's about a, the struggle to save the vaquita, but what's threatening the vaquita is in fact the illegal fishing of a different animal entirely. Uh, the totoaba fish whose swim bladder is extremely valuable in China. And it's a film about conservation biologists attempts to preserve the vaquita population, but it's also a film about activists going out at night with drones and cutting fishing nets and cooperating with the Mexican Navy. And it's a film about governmental corruption and drug cartels and Mexican journalists getting death threats. So being here with the two of you, Matt Podolsky and Ru Mahoney, I'm curious if you, you can talk perhaps both of you a little bit about how a film that is this complicated with this many moving pieces came to be, who approached who, how did this all happen? So yes, this film started uh, sort of the genesis for myself was uh, a short documentary called Souls of the Vermilion Sea um, that I produced and directed with my colleague Sean Bogle and uh, we started working on that film in 2015 um, and we sort of got, um, I mean, our original intention was to produce a feature length documentary. Um, we got about a year into production and we sort of had this realization moment of like, wow, this, like things are moving so fast. And like the scientists were predicting that the species could be extinct within only a few years. And our whole goal was to produce content that could have, you know, at least potentially have an impact on the outcome of the issue. Um, and so we sort of like regrouped and uh, sort of adjusted our strategy and decided to, you know, put together this short film using the footage that we had captured up until that point. Um, and that film became Souls of the Vermilion Sea. Um, we brought Rue on board. We reached out to Rue uh, to, to help us with the impact campaign for that short film. And then as we were sort of going through this process of like, screening Souls of the Vermilion Sea at festivals and trying to reach out and networking um, and trying to, you know, still trying to sort of uh, pull together those uh, partners that could transform the story into that feature um, that sort of like, uh, you know, like we knew there was a much larger story there, right, than what we were able to capture in that first short film. Um, and I mean, this was like, this was the summer of 2017 that we were going through this process. And right around that time, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio started tweeting uh, about the Vaquita and sending these tweets to uh, the president of Mexico. And there was this really interesting sort of like interaction between uh, the, the now former president of, of Mexico and Leonardo DiCaprio, um, where they were actually engaging each other on this issue. And that sort of led to this in-person meeting and this MOU that developed out of that. And we started to think like, whoa, this you know really high profile celebrity is interested in this issue. Um, and so we, you know, that sort of became like a goal of like, I wonder if we could make contact with Leonardo DiCaprio, right? And simultaneously, like, and coincidentally, we also had started uh, chatting with this other filmmaker, Richard Lodkani. Um, and Richard was also really interested in the Vaquita issue. Um, and Richard had a connection with Leonardo DiCaprio and his production company from his previous film, The Ivory Game, that Leonardo DiCaprio was a, an executive producer on. So all these things started to like feel realistic um, and the pieces started to kind of fall into place. And I, that was sort of the inception of it, right? Um, and yeah, from there, I mean, we were working on this deadline because uh, in the summer of 2017, we had just found out that there was going to be this capture effort for the Vaquita um, mm -hmm. in the fall of that year. And so we, we all of us knew that that was an essential component to a feature length film on this topic. Um, but it was a really tight deadline. Like we had to pull all these pieces together and like formalize all of these partnerships 
uh, within a really short period of time in order to make that happen and like pull together uh, the crew that we were able to send down there in the fall of that year. Yeah, I, d I don't think I've ever worked on a film which has come together like quite quite that quickly and sort of magically. Um, I, th I think you ended up with a, with a really special combination of, you know, Matthew and Sean's kind of deep expertise. They had experience working with a lot of the NOAA folks who were partnering on the science expedition, um, you know, with the Bikita. And then you, you had a, a production company like Terra Mater and, you know, with obviously a, a huge kind of history of successful feature length films. Uh, and then, you know, add to that, you had Andrea Crosta with the investigative angle. And, you know, he had worked with Sean and Matt in the past. He had also worked with Terra Mater in the past. Um, and it was really, I think we, uh, we all sat down in person for the very first time, I think, uh, in Wyoming at, at the Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival. And literally within months, we were all like living together in a house in Mexico, like figuring out how to make this film. Um, so it was, it was kind of quite a special, you know, coming together of, of different parties. Um, you know, in terms of the impetus from the, from the impact angle, I'll just say that, you know, I think one of the things that was really fascinating about this film and one of the reasons I was really excited, you know, that, that Sean and Matt brought me onto this project um, was that it, we knew from the beginning that you know, the reasons the Vaquita was facing extinction were not just conservation crises, right? They were the result of lots of other things like geopolitical instability and, you know, a lack of you know, access to, um, you know, economic alternatives and whatnot. And so as an impact producer, it was a really special opportunity to take something um, like a conservation crisis and to tell a story that helped global audiences kind of get more familiar with the idea that sometimes we look at these conservation crises around the world, but oftentimes solving them requires us to take action far outside of the conservation space. And so, um, you know, from an impact angle, that was baked into this film from the very beginning. And I think that it made all the difference in terms of the story we got to tell and then how successfully that story dovetailed with the campaign that came after. So, yeah, you mentioned the role of impact producer. And just in case viewers for this film festival aren't familiar with that role, do you want to explain what that involves. Well, I can explain what it means for me. I think, you know, impact yeah. is, a, is a relatively new field. Um, not, not completely new, but it definitely has more of a footprint in Europe and the UK. It's no surprise that most mm -hmm. of my clients are based there. Um, and I do think at the moment you'll probably find as many explanations for impact producing as, as there are impact producers. Um, so if you're looking to hire one, make sure you ask questions about what they think impact producing is. Uh, you know, for, for myself, I come from you know, a very academic background, and so I take a very academic approach to impact producing. And that means really leaning into the, the best available research that is out there about how to talk about a particular topic to the audience that most needs to hear it. And so, you know, with Sea of Shadows being an example, you know, as we sort of said before, you know, there were, it was not just a conservation crisis. We knew we wanted to speak to audiences about, about conservation, but we also had to be able to talk to them about the importance of, you know, sustainable fishing and alternative livelihoods and how do you, how do you promote policy shift at both the national and international level and understanding how to do that effectively within the scope of a campaign um, for a film which has a finite window and a finite budget um, you know requires kind of mapping out where the levers of power are and what's within your sphere of influence to to kind of try and shift those levers of power in a more positive direction um, and that so that requires things like landscape assessments and national mapping and kind of understanding you know pairing messaging the right message with the right audience per you know demographic um, you know in order to get them to take the right action and so there's there's tremendous amount of research and science that goes into kind of mapping that and you know my approach to impact producing is to kind of lean into that space and see how it's relevant to the story at hand well, yeah, so I, go ahead, Matt. Oh, sorry, I, I would just add that, I mean, I think one of the things, Rue, that you're always talking about is like the importance of working with an impact producer, like from the starting point, right? Um, and, you know, incorporating those ideas into the story itself. Um, and one of the things that we were seeing uh, in relation to the Vaquita issue, um, you know, going back to when we first got uh, in, involved in the issue in 2015, was um, it was really, really common to see these, the, the fishermen who were participating in this illegal Tatuaba fishery to be demonized, right? Like the media, like what little media coverage this issue was getting was pointing the finger at these 
fishermen in this small community in the northern Gulf of California. And, you know, we had, we had been in this community and we felt like we had sort of gained this understanding of like the sort of economics that were at play. And we like, we empathized with those fishermen because we felt like we could understand like where they were coming from, right? They didn't want to be like in this position, right? Um, and it was sort of the, the politics, the political situation, but also the economic situation that forced a lot of these people into this, you know, really difficult situation. And it's like, you can't point the finger at those folks who have been, you know, placed in this like incredibly difficult sort of predicament where they have to either go out and participate in this very dangerous illegal fishery that has a lot of risks or they don't have an income and they can't feed their families. Um, and so we really like that was one of the central goals of Sea of Shadows was to shift that narrative, right? Um, and, and to show people that um, those fishermen, those members of the community members are not the enemy. And I think, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like uh, that's, I feel like we were able to accomplish that to a degree, right? Yeah, I mean, I would say certainly one of the things that uh, really struck me watching this film is how much it did focus on the environmental justice angle, which is not, is not a given in films that are basically about poaching, right? Um, and not to give any spoilers, because I don't know at what point of the, the film festival they'll, they'll show this, but there is an incredibly poignant storyline there with one of the people who has been fishing who's had his nets cut and he's gotten deep into debt um, from these nets. And I'm wondering how, how you managed to incorporate stories like this. Did it come organically from kind of being embedded in the community? I mean, that's, um, that's a very tricky story to tell and comes with all kinds of complications. Yeah, um, that was that, that was an interesting experience was to go to go and find that that individual. But I'm I'm really glad that we did. Um, you know, I think as with any production, when you're looking for for characters like that, you put a huge amount of faith in you know your local fixers and your local connections and the you know the families who um, you know everyone had had developed relationships with that that this was the right you know people to talk to, the right person to consider bringing into the film. Um, it doesn't mean that it wasn't a nerve wracking experience. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go and meet that particular contributor uh, before the film team did, and it was definitely a nerve-wracking experience. But again, you know, we really did feel passionately convinced that that it was important, like like Matt said, to have that narrative, you know, there. One of the things we didn't go into in the film, um, but that we touched on in terms of you know the, the motivation for that individual to participate in the film was that you know his he was raised by a single mother and she had cancer, and you know he was trying to afford chemo therapy for her and you know hence when, you, when you're trying to choose between poaching and, and poverty and especially when you have the life of a loved one on the line uh, most of us would probably make similar choices you know given the circumstances and I think for us you know the, the film definitely does still kind of point out that like poaching is really destructive and that it's really important you know the, we, it doesn't and that's one of the things I think I'm proud of from a um, you know impact narrative standpoint is that the film does a great job of kind of holding space for very different worldviews in, in a respectful way. And so you absolutely admire the amazing work that groups like Sea Shepherd are doing on the front lines in that film. But you also, the, the film also makes space for you as, a, as an audience member to have compassion at the same time for the situation that some of these poachers have found themselves in. Um, and, you, and that, and it's, it's, by, it's by creating emotional space for all of those narratives to, to kind of reach the audience together that you start to be willing as an audience member to grab ask that this is a this is a web of issues that need to be solved it's not black and white this is not just about prosecuting poachers and and as an impact producer what that allowed us to do just very strategically is to point towards calls to action on the campaign side that might have seemed out of step you know if we had made a film that was like poachers are bad um, and then we had said please sign this petition to the Mexican government asking for them to invest and alternative livelihoods for fishermen, you know, that would have felt really disconnected from the message. And so one of the things I think that is so important, as Matt said, about kind of integrating impact from the beginning and having a story that tells this very nuanced approach is it lets you point towards more meaningful calls to action after the film. And, and I think ultimately do more important work with the film. And I mean, I think that 
like what you just pointed out, Rue, I think is also really important when you just think about it, like from a big picture, right? Because I mean, the reality is like, this is, uh, you know, this is a small community in, you know, Northwestern Mexico. And, you know, like it's, it, it's a very small group of people who are being directly impacted by what's going on um, in this film, right? But, you know, a big part of my hope was that by sort of, taking this really like deep dive and, you know, analyzing all these different perspectives and like showing, you know, the sort of the passion and the, pers but like the passion behind the perspective of those folks working on the Sea Shepherd boat, right? But showing that that like, it, that coexists with the perspective of these fishermen, right? And neither one of them are necessarily right or wrong, um, but showing that complexity and like forcing audience members to realize that, like these issues are super complicated. Like there's no easy answer. And this is what conservation looks like, right? This is not like the, the Vaquita issue. I mean, yes, there are certain aspects of the, all these issues surrounding the Vaquita and the Tatuaba that are unique to this area and to that particular situation. But on the whole, like this is what conservation looks like, right? And I mean, this is the way that we need to be addressing conservation issues all around the globe, right? Thinking about them, uh, not in with this, uh, thinking about them from this, this broader perspective and thinking about how the economics and the politics and all these other issues are intertwined. So speaking of that broader perspective, um, one of the really compelling characters in this film is this Mexican journalist, uh, Carlos Loe, um, is it, sorry, Carlos Loe de Mola. Um, and at a certain point, it becomes clear that in his investigation of corruption, which is also tied into this, he's starting to get death threats. And I'm wondering how you dealt with that as you're filming, as you're incorporating his storyline into the film. You know, there is obviously a serious risk here to various, to, to, to various individuals you're working with, certainly for him, but also for some of the people who were on the ground. I mean, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, there were definitely, uh, I mean, so, so Carlos was with us for a portion of our first shoot um, in San Felipe uh, in the Northern Gulf of California. Um, but then after he started getting death threats, he, he, he couldn't come back, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely, I mean, and I mean, obviously it wasn't just Carlos either. I mean, that like safety concerns were definitely um, something we had to put a lot of thought in, which, you know, um, was, I, I don't know. It, 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 was, it was a strange situation like for, for us, right? I mean, like I said before, you know, um, I had been working in the area for several years with a very small crew uh, you know with like not really I, I mean we were aware that that there like were these these concerns and we were aware of the involvement of the, of, of the cartels in these issues mm -hmm. um but we our approach was just to blend in right? right because we were a really small crew once this project became so much bigger and we had like an eight person crew well um, and you had the science expedition happening and so absolutely plus the yeah pl you're right and absolutely in that the fall of 2017 i mean there were 70 you know uh, uh research scientists from uh, around the traveling world. from all over the world to, to come into there so all of a sudden like these safety concerns were extremely elevated um and yeah i mean we we had to take precautions and um yeah i mean for the crew and the characters for sure I mean, just at a technical level, uh, I, I think I'd be neglecting my duty if I didn't ask how you kind of approach the challenges of, of not just, you know, journalistically figuring out, you know, where those, those, those risk assessments lie, but, but in terms of filming a nighttime chase scene and shootout, like on, on boats, um, this has some kinds of technical challenges that I, I just really can't wrap my head around. And how did you... How did you plan to shoot scenes like that? 
I don't think we did. I don't yeah, think no, we, we did we not. We definitely <laughs> weren't planning <laughs> yeah, for that one. So uh, okay. I, I, I can jump in on that one, Matt, because I, I mo only just because I, I think I was at the kind of like uh, WhatsApp central command sort of. Right, <laughs> yeah. Between, between all the different crews. Um, you know, so we knew that we were trying, obviously, to, to capture some filming of, of these nighttime patrols. Uh, we, we didn't know what would happen, um, obviously, but we the way we approached it from a logistical standpoint, you know, as Matt said, we actually had quite a large crew. Uh, and what, what that allowed us to do is to have multiple cameras on multiple boats. And so on various nights, you know, you might have um, a boat and sound, or I'm sorry, a camera and sound on a Sea Shepherd boat, and you might have, um, you know, a couple people over on a Navy boat. Uh, and I think there were a few times we even had like a third with the, uh, you know, on land kind of Navy patrols and stuff, which, which is where I spent most of my time kind of like trying to WhatsApp. It, hilariously, WhatsApp became quite central to our ability to communicate with one another um, and track live locations of where everyone was. Um, you know, so from a logistical standpoint, you know, we knew that we wanted to kind of capture the, the coordination that takes place between um, you know, the Navy's uh, kind of patrols on land and, and then also at sea and then also Sea Shepherd. Um, you know, and obviously from a storytelling perspective, it was beneficial to capture some, some really kind of you know, high octane sort of footage you know, for, for an eco thriller like this. Um, but we definitely didn't go out like knowing that that was gonna happen. Um, it was just kind of documenting the Navy in the course of what they do. And, and this is quite genuinely a, a, a big part of what they do. Um, you know, and same thing with like, you know, happening to be filming with Sea Shepherd when, when the drone was shot down. Um, you know, that drone had been shot at a few times, uh, you know, and we were just out capturing, you know, Jack, the character from Sea Shepherd in the film, you know, doing the work that he does. Uh, and so I think a lot of it just came down to uh, putting in the time. Um, it, it was quite, a, you know, there were multiple shoots that went from many, many weeks at a time. So overall, it had quite a long, you know, shooting window altogether. And I think that that really allowed for us to have the opportunity to capture um, a collection of, you know, the amazing footage that you see edited together in the film. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it, it you're right. I mean, the, those like most dramatic scenes, like, obviously weren't planned, right. But I mean, we definitely, like, we knew we wanted, we wanted to show like, the impossibility of the enforcement, right. Um, and like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think like th those events played out and like the scene, I mean, there's, there's one particular scene that I think showcases like how, like n not only how difficult, right. But it also makes you question like the sort of motivations of the, the, the Navy officers who are tasked with doing this enforcement. Um, and you start to realize like who's really in control in this town. Um, and you start to realize that the cartels have more control than, than the Mexican Navy does, right? And that was an absolutely like critical thing for us to document and show people in the movie because that's like the crux of it, right? I mean, the entire time that I have been involved in this issue, like every, you know, it, it's just one of the things that gets repeated over and over and over again, right? It's like, we need more enforcement. We need more Navy personnel. Um, you know, we have these laws on the books now, but nobody's enforcing them. Um, like, there was a reason that nobody's enforcing them, right? Because, like, those, the folks who are being tasked with, like, carrying out that enforcement effort are afraid of the cartels. Um, and that makes the whole task an impossible task. Well, I guess I'm curious to hear whether you've got an update since you since you wrapped this film um you know whether uh, gosh from i guess andrea crosta's investigation i think he, he it, the film concludes with him going to china right or up to about the fishermen or yeah, yeah. Um, I can I can jump in on this a bit. You know, China actually, um, you know, China is often at the center of you know so many sorts of conservation crises. I think this is an instance in which they've actually done quite a lot of law enforcement around this, uh, mu much more than Mexico has, uh, and that's why a huge part of the effort around the campaign was we did quite a lot of work in Mexico City um, and in Baja and around Baja. 
um, you know, to, to try and you know, pressure from an international level. And that was everything from working with the U.S. Department of State to working with CITES to create pressure on the Mexican government to actually take meaningful action. Um, and, and there were a few kind of key outcomes, I guess, that, that I'll share. Uh, you know, the, the positive thing is, is that, you know, the, the vaquita is not extinct. I, I won't pretend that it's in a great conservation situation. It definitely is not. Um, you know, but the, but the species is still there uh, as, far, as far as we know. Uh, the Mexican government has increased uh, the the amount of law enforcement um, that is present in San Felipe and in, and in Baja. There's about 600 additional Marines and about four, uh, 14 additional Profepa agents, which is sort of their you know wildlife law enforcement. But as Matt said, you know the numbers is not what matters. It's it's how much enforcement is actually mm -hmm. happening. There has not been a massive increase in the number of arrests, and so you know whether or not that kind of increased show of force is sufficient by itself um, has kind of yet to be seen. What we have seen, and I think is probably the most kind of encouraging, uh, are a couple of different things. In Baja, later this month, there was actually just at, at a regional level, at a state level, um, there is a ruling that all gillnets have to get turned over. Uh, and of course, a lot of the fishermen are already saying there's going to be riots and violence over this, yeah. right? Because previously, you were not supposed to be using your gillnets, but they hadn't gone around and actually scooped them up and said, like, you have to give those to us. Um, and this is a very complicated issue because a lot of people, you know, took out loans for nets and they're, they're still trying to pay off those loans, um, you know, and then now they're being told they have to switch to other equipment and that, that beca becomes a, a very real and big financial burden. And so people will not feel very kindly about giving over, you know, nets that they may still owe several thousand dollars in loan payments on. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out. I think what's probably the most encouraging is that on the congressional level, just last month, um, the Mexican Senate actually passed a bill saying that there would be mandatory jail time associated with Totoaba poaching. And along with that, Senator Murat put forward a bill that says there has to be investment in alternative livelihoods within a very specific time frame so that this happens quickly because oftentimes things get passed but they don't come to fruition. That, that bill, that package is now sitting over on the congressional side of the Mexican government um, and it's expected to be voted on by the end of this month. And, and everything indicates that it's going to pass. Um, but, but if it does, that will be a very significant step forward because you're bringing together, number one, really, really kind of motivating penalties for being caught poaching. And then at the same time, also a, you know, rigorous investment in alternative livelihoods to try and make up for that. Um, but again, it all comes down to you know, how it's implemented. And in terms of the science, is there, are we any closer to understanding why uh, the vaquita cannot be established as a breeding pair in captivity? I, I mean, I, I think that right, I mean, from the beginning of, you know, the inception of this idea of, uh, you know, trying to launch a at least like a temporary, you know, they, they, they weren't calling it a captive breeding program, but a temporary sure, sanctuary, but that's, right? right. Um, and I mean, like from the outset, you know, all of those researchers knew that there was a good chance that it wasn't going to work, right? Because there are mm -hmm. some species of cetaceans that just won't handle captivity. Um, and so, you know, the reaction of that particular, that one particular animal that was captured, I think, immediately told those researchers that this must be, unfortunately, one of those species that just won't mm -hmm. handle um, captivity. Um, I mean, obviously it's a very small sample size. Um, and I, like, I, I, I'm sure there's disagreement like among researchers and I'm sure there's folks that, you know, would say you should go back out there and try again. Um, but the risk is just so great um, that, you know, the, the Mexican government agency that makes that decision was unwilling to sort of take that, that risk. But I, I, think, it, I think it's important to, um, to point out here how remarkable it is that the vaquita is not extinct yet, right? When, when I first got involved in this issue in 2015, uh, everybody was predicting the vaquita would be extinct by 2018. Um, and one of the things that you see in the film during one of these like really intense efforts to try to capture these vaquitas. So, um, you know, you see the, 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 these crews, the, the capture crews set these nets up out in the ocean. They're, they were using essentially the same nets, 
that the Tatuaba poachers use, with the one key difference being that they weren't weighted, so that when the vaquitas hit those nets and became entangled, they could come to the surface to take a breath, right? Um, the vaquitas that are getting entangled in these illegal Tatuaba nets, um, they're drowning because they can't come up to the surface. Um, and so the idea was like, they would get caught in these nets, immediately come to the surface, and then all of these crews and these boats would immediately converge and you know, make sure that that animal is safe. And that's what happened, right? They were able to successfully do that. But you see in one of these capture efforts, you watch one of these animals go right under the net, right? They're heading straight for that net and then they don't hit it, right? And so all of these research, like as soon as that happened, you know, and we got such unbelievable footage of it, you can see it, like it's, it seems like the only thing that could have happened is that animal intentionally dove down under the net, right? And so immediately all these researchers started hypothesizing, like, is it possible that like certain individual vaquitas like can see the nets or sometimes they can see the nets and it's just that there are so many out there that they're like, it's just impossible for them to like see all of them. Um, and that is like sort of the working hypothesis of the researchers that are involved in this right now is that there is like, could be like a remnant, very, very small population. I mean, we're talking like 10 or maybe fewer individuals who have figured out how to avoid the nets, right? Because if you look at the numbers and you look at the rate of decline, they should be gone. So there may be, in fact, a small community of super smart vaquitas who are outsmarting poachers, essentially. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that's a well, hypothesis, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, a, a lot of this is like, there's so many unknowns here, right? Because it's, it's a species that's so difficult to, to study. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, all of the information, I mean, not all of it, but a huge amount of the information that we have about the species comes from just these remote acoustics acoustic detectors, this network mm -hmm. of hydrophones um, that are specifically programmed to detect the high frequency sonar clicks of these animals. And just by analyzing the frequency of those clicks, uh, the researchers can come up with a rough population estimate and they can see, you know, get a rough idea of the movements of um, those animals. Um, and so, I mean, that's the only way that we currently know that, that they're not extinct, right? Um, you know, absent of additional visual surveys, uh, which are extremely expensive. To and I think it's been a year since that happened, since there yeah. were any. any yeah, and there was, there was supposed to be another one this year, I believe, which was canceled because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's the, I mean, uh, one of the sort of aspects of this that, like, gives me hope, right, is that you know, like, is this species adapting? Like, is it possible that this tiny remnant population, like, maybe could survive this uh, really intense bottleneck? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Well, um, and interestingly, there there has been some genetic uh, research that was published that that indicates. I mean, obviously, you know, you never know for sure, especially with kind of a remote population with it like this. But you know, they um, scientists do take biopsies from uh, animals which which unfortunately show up dead in nets as well as you know, the animals that were captured during the, the rescue effort uh, and and the indication is is that there has been you know a significant kind of evolutionary bottleneck in the past and they do think that there is sufficient genetic uh, diversity that this species is not vestigially extinct um, but that if they were left alone that the vaquita could in fact you know recover uh, which which is kind of remarkable when when the population has gotten so low which makes the the recent policy uh, developments very encouraging certainly exactly well that's uh, a, a rare hopeful note for us to be able to end on in in 2020 so i think we should probably leave it there um thank you so much both of you for taking the time to chat about this remarkable film thank you yeah thanks <laughs>